Welcome to the Chef United way and it's time to welcome a no-nonsense defender who always put his head or nose where it hurts, a cult figure always popular with the lane faithful, an Australian blade, Douglas John Hodgson. Welcome. How are you, Doug? Hey, all good, mate. Great to speak to you, buddy. I hope um, you've got some sunshine over there because we're coming out of a real bad winter over here in Australia. But as you probably know, and I said to you, I'm at the present moment in time in New Zealand. Why? Um, with work. Um, with work, and there's other reasons which I won't go into, which is a very <laughs> dear <heard>. friend. <laughs> which a dear friend will probably we will start with the story that why I ended up in um, Western Australia. It yeah. Was a I mean, time to leave West, uh, Victoria. <laughs> but that's a, a story. We'll get onto that as we go through. Well, we'll try and do chronologically the story of Doug Hodgson as much as we possibly can. You know, we need to probably talk about how you got into football in a country where Aussie rules football, rugby, cricket, they're kind of more popular, or certainly it appears that way. So how did you get into football? It's funny, Hill, because um, growing up in an area which is called the Pines Estate, Frankston Pine Soccer Club, um, there's a housing commission area. Mum and Dad were obviously on the 10-pound um, boat ride to Australia. Dad was a plumber by trade, and I have to admit, probably the worst taps in the house <laughs> of plumbing. We ended up um, coming down, and Mum and Dad joined a club called Frankston Pines Soccer Club. Growing up from the Pines, it was probably about 500 metres from my house was a soccer club. Now, how does an Australian become playing soccer? Mum and Dad were from England, I'm from Sunderland. I was fortunate enough to have... Uh, two passports, an Australian one and a British one, which allowed me to work in the UK. And I played junior soccer at Frankston Pine Soccer Club nearly all my life. Obviously, as a kid, I was a centre forward. Obviously. I scored quite a few goals. Um, I represented my state, which is Victoria, um, at 13s, 14s and 15s. I played cricket and Aussie rules and the cricket was from the same club. So I had mates at school that played uh, Aussie rules and then I obviously had me playing soccer and then I played cricket as well as my soccer. So my, father, my dad used to th say to me I was, um, I was a better cricketer than a soccer player. I made 100 when I was 12. Um, I made 88, 71. I represented the Morning Peninsula side in Frankston. Um, obviously, there's another level, then another level above. That's Victoria, so it's state. So, decent level, but soccer was my passion. I started kicking the ball when I was four. And um, unfortunately, as we get on to there, we, we went three years undefeated with some close mates who I'm still close to friends now. Um, some funny stories were when I played against Villa, they're all the boys. So, I've got friendships of mates of. I'm 53 now, and I've known most of my mates since I was four. Would you say there were players you were playing with that were as good as you, and you're surprised they didn't go on to play soccer professionally? There was a little, there was a younger, Craigie Lewis is younger than me. Craigie would be 50, I've just had a text for Saturday night, party our place. I'm tipping <laughs> it would be 50 or 51st. He actually went to Rangers um, as a kid before me. So he was, he was 16, 17, he'd done his apprenticeship at Glasgow Rangers. So he was a very talented young man, centre forward, and um, still good friends with Craigie, and he was a very, very a very good player, um, striker. So the two of us probably had t the talent at the club. When we talk about juniors, um, soccer back in them days was pretty big because obviously all the ethnics from around, I suppose, the world come to live in Australia. So soccer was huge um, yeah. because of the communities, such as our Frankston Pines Soccer Club was, let's say, it was English and Scots and Irish, but mainly Scots and Pines. Um, and then you've got um, Heidelberg, which obviously the later in the story, mm -hmm. they're Greeks. South Melbourne, Greeks. The A-League clubs um, that are now playing 
obviously they took the Greek and the nationality to try and stop the racism. It wasn't right. And it's, and I actually get it. Like the Italian clubs, the Italian people supported the Italian community or the Greeks mm. did or the Macedonians did. So you understand the background of the ethnics here in Australia. So it was um, quite, you know, it's, Disappointing, but there, there was racist, not racist is not the right word, but there was conflict between, you know, let's just say Croatia and the Serbians because of the wars back home, and that led into the soccer fields. So a bit like Sheffield United and Sheffield Wednesday, but probably yeah. <laughs> it yeah. might keep, be a little keep, bit Keep it light, Doug. Keep it light. There, so. <laughs> How does Doug Hodgson go on to yep. become a professional footballer? I was junior tennis champion at the local junior tennis champion. I won that before my car accident. I played cricket and I played soccer. Me in school, well, well let's just say not, not, school's not for everyone. Agreed. When I left school, they actually said to my dad, we had a chicken farm at that stage and I was driving back home, front end loaders, I could drive at 15. Um, we had a chicken farm, we used to get 5,000 eggs a day and I was working machinery and then he went down he said, do you think I'm doing him a favour to take him out of school? <laughs> and he said to me, the teachers couldn't say yes quick enough. <laughs> I said, yes, I think you do very well out nice. of school. They wanted me out of school. It was, get, it was leave or get kicked out, I believe. So I left school, had a car accident at 15, and um, it, it, it hit me pretty hard. I wore a neck brace for two and a half years. <laughs> I had a... Um, Three fractured ribs, broken jaw, four fractured teeth. I've done my back and my neck, done the injuries. There were seven of us in a little car. We got hit at 100 k's, which is about 80 miles an hour. Broke the car in half. The girl that was driving was, you know, she was no, she had horses on our farm. Um, another mate had stitches from his, 52 stitches. We called him Flip Top. That was his nickname after that. Um, and another mate, um, he died. Um, at open heart surgery. They saved his life. He's still with us today. And they um, open heart surgery on the table. His main aid order to his heart was punctured three places. So we were fortunate that we survived and we got through it. And um, I was told at that age that I will never play soccer again. That this is the age of 15. Yeah, 15. Wow. So at 15, it was, um, it was a, as you would imagine, it was a setback. I was working on mum and dad's farm. So... I couldn't do heavy lifting, duties. It, um, it was quite tough. And it's funny as we say it, and I don't say funny lightly, but uh, I drive past that intersection every day now to go to work. And 1st of December is when the car accident was. I'll never forget it. And the day that I learned that I would never play soccer again by reading an MRI was the 1st of December. So you know how people have um, days they don't like? Let's mm -hmm. just say 1st of December is not one of my happy ones. So I played that and um, I'd done whatever I could do to try and get myself fit and healthy and I ended up turning to martial arts. And I'd done martial arts for a couple of years. I can and, believe um, this. Mind over matter and it was, I think it was about 18 i done Zendu Kai, which is a you know, form of kickboxing karate. And um, basically, the mind, is a, the mind is a weapon. You know, you talk about what you can and can't do, mindsets, you know. And people say I'm a very resilient man, <clears throat> but I'll say no is not in my vocab. If you said to me, oh, you can't do this, well, I'll find a way that I can do it. Because that's just the way I don't know if that was the way I was born or that the way it made me. Struggled at 15, psychologist. Um, they taught me meditation. They taught me all sorts of uh, different things. And um, I ended up becoming a bouncer at 18, doing security. So security was good. I could get rid of anger. <laughs> I yep. could try and pick up some girls. <laughs> and I got paid for it. So I thought, this is not a bad life. So I had the bag out the back and the speed ball, the floor, the ceiling ball, and I trained every day into a stage I you know, went, you know what, I'm going to have soccer. I'm going to give it a crack again at soccer. And I did. Well, I went back to soccer, and um, it's quite uh, Ernie Merrick 
if you Google Ernie Merrick, he was Melbourne Victory's coach, A-League. He coached me, and he, he never forget that. We needed a player. We needed a, a, a defender one day. And he said, Doug, do you want me? I said, mate, I'll play anywhere. I'm just happy to play. I said, so I played at the back and knocked the balls around and did some pieces. Anyway, done that, and he looked at me. But previous to that, I used to let the goalkeeper throw the ball out. Well, I used to just line the right back up and then just go. <laughs> and that was me. And he said to me, centre forwards don't tackle like that. He says, I'm going to put you at the back. And that's where I changed and I become a defender. And um, I suppose the rest is in history because, as you know, my debut was as a striker. Yeah, and as you know, the book, as it says, the red card. If I'd yeah. scored on my first touch, yeah, absolutely. So that's where, that, so that's where the um, I changed, obviously, and I played. I ended up getting. I went from Frankston Pines, which my dad was president of. So mum and dad were involved in the club heavily. That was involved in the, with the FFV later on in life and also the ASF, which is Australian Soccer Federation. So Dad was very, very, very deeply involved in, I'll say, the development of soccer. So the pathway is that's how I got through. And um, I went to Dufton, which is a Premier League, and then from Dufton I went to Heidelberg. Mm-hmm. So Heidelberg is where obviously Sheffield United bought me from. Yeah. Absolutely. That's the um, that's the club that so, the Blades fans will will have known and heard about before because of absolutely of that that kind of pre season that Sheffield United did in Australia, and we probably should get to that. How did the move to Sheffield United actually come about? For those that don't know, Doug. So Heidelberg was good, and I tell you, we'll go to Hull City. So a man called Ken Wagstaff. Do you know Kenny Wagstaff? Hull City yeah, legend. Yeah. Kevin Musket. You know Kevin Musket. We know Kevin Musket quite well. People will know. Absolutely. Um, he, Muskie, was at Sunshine George Cross. I went on loan. So our season had finished, my first season. So I had a great first season. I won Best and Fairest um, at Heidelberg. From, um, so Dufton to Heidelberg. And then basically Sunshine George Cross invited me to, on loan off season. So a way of making money. I was working on the uh, onshore with the oil rigs. I've done many of jobs, landscape gardener, tree lopper. I um, used to roll up to the Victorian training when we played JFK. And here's me with me, me bag on me thing. Everyone else is in suit and tie. I'm in a sleeve that's been ripped apart. I've been that chainsaw in my hand for 10 hours cutting down trees. And um, the boys looked at me and went, uh, the, the office today? I said, not like you pretty boys. I said, look how good you guys are in your suits. The bag of fruit. So I... Um, I went to Sunshine George Cross and basically Ken Wagstaff liked what he saw. And he says, I'm going to send you to the um, whole city. Mm. Terry Dool and um, Jeff Lee was there. And I went for a pre-season there and they offered me a two-year deal. So I got offered a two-year deal at Hull City and Heidelberg wanted $140,000 for me. Now... Back then, 140 grand was a lot of money, obviously. 20,000 pound, obviously, which would be about 50 Australian instead of 140. And you got to remember, Hall was I went from Heidelberg, from Dufton to Heidelberg for free. Mm. Nought. I played one year. Yeah. And I uh, had best in Ferris, had a good year. And off I trotted to Hull. They're there six weeks, seven weeks, scored on my debut against Derby. Um, for Hull City in the reserves in the Ponton Leagues and basically turned around and um, they got hit on the head. They couldn't come to terms with the figures. And let, if you say angry or anger, was a, an, a, a, it's in a cheap word to say because pretty pissed off was probably a better word to say, mate. Yeah, <laughs> it wasn't oh, your whole future imagine. would have been different. Well, I would have been two years earlier. Yeah. Um, knowledgeable would have been two years greater. Experience would have been better. Um, where it gone and what I could have done. But the most of all was I nearly gave the game away when I was at Heidelberg because my lower back was quite – I was having some trouble with my back. And um, basically, I remember, I remember my mum saying, so, well, listen, son, you were told you'd never play. 
and you've got to this start, which is A League, which is the old National League in in um, Australia. So I did think about giving it away then, but I, I, as you do, you keep pushing, and you do the best you can. And um, I went back, pretty unhappy, as you'd imagine. Um, threw me toys out the pram for a little bit, and then got up back on with the job. Two years later, the police wanted to speak to me. It was a scenario doing security. Um, would have been only um, like attacked me, and I obviously self defence. Would have only been um, probably assault charge if anything. Handbag at four paces, we call that in England. Mm-hmm. But like when I went to Bruce Dyer and Oldham Athletic in the tunnel. Yeah. That's another story when we get to it. So basically, police wanted to speak to me, and um, I thought I got offered an opportunity to go to Western Australia, which is Perth, which is a four and a half hour flight from Melbourne. And I've gone, yeah, it might be a good time just to go over there for a year and <laughs> off season again. I have a bit of time away. And basically, what happened was um, in between there, like I was saying, I played against JFK for Victoria. Um, basically, the Duca played in that game. Uh, I was trying to think. Harry Kuehl was younger then, but the Aussie boys, and then I basically went over to um, Perth and Sheffield United were touring. That was the year they got relegated. So, obviously, Dave Bassett was there. Nathan Blake was there. Glenn Hodges, Gailey. Um, I basically done my trial in Australia. Sean Murphy flew back from, he was at Knox County at the time. Now, me and Smurf and Kevin Musket was a back three at Heidelberg United. Wow. So the three of us would have been, you know, we were young, but that was our that was our defence, Musky, Murph and me. Sean Murphy, obviously, that's how the relationship with Sean I knew. So went over there, Sean flew back, but he'd already lived with me when he came in at Heidelberg. So I looked down and I went, they done a big write up on me in the uh, program. Oh, and I thought, this is a chance. So, head down, bum up. I went, let's give it what it's got. Upgrade the fitness level, stop drinking. Obviously, didn't drink before a game anyway. Um, but I thought, you know, let's, let's cut down and let's get the diet. Let's give us every opportunity I possibly could. And we played at the Wacker Friday the 13th. I had a good game in the, an agent, which is Gary Williams, who'd done the whole marketing for. Sheffield United came up to me and said, um, here's a card. He put it over my shoulder and he said, uh, how much is on your head? I said to him, 140,000. So I knew that's mm-hmm. what they would have sold me for. So 140 grand. He said, okay. After the game went in, came over, got chatting. He says, right. He said, um, speak to you. He said, I'm going to take you on tour. So they went from Sheffield and I went and played against Adelaide City, which was Carl Veer. Mm-hmm. Carl Veard obviously played against him. I didn't. I was still in process. Mum and Dad had flew in to see me because Mum and Dad were living in Newcastle at, the, at that stage. I basically flew out and I met him in New South Wales playing against Northern New South Wales State team. And that was funny. That was funny. First game, never played in the back four. The old days was a two and a sweeper. Centre half and a sweeper used to go behind, never in a flat four. I never forget it. I'm right in there. Training was good. Paul Rogers, Dodger. I said to Dodger, I said, hey, give me a bit of chop out here, mate. I said, uh, never played in a flat four. Talk to me. He looked at me. He says, you're kidding, aren't you? He says, what? He said, I thought you were going to give me a chop out. I've never played centre half before. <laughs> yeah, so a Dodge that. was a midfielder, as you know. So I've gone, you're kidding me. Anyway, I had a decent game. There's brothers on the right wing. He was playing out right. I said, Brad, tuck in. Brad's has gone, I can't. I said, what do you mean you can't? He said, I've got nothing left in the point. The point's done. It's nearly empty. you got to remember these boys just got – I look back now and laugh because the boys got relegated from the Premier League. They're playing to Australia. They're on a jolly up. You know, yeah, no disrespect. I understand it. But, you know, I think the first, second year I played 65 games in one year. You know, it's a lot of football. Sun shining. Weather's nice. Be as cold. What more would an English man want? Absolutely. So yeah. we ended up playing, had a good game, cleared a couple off the line and done well. Training I done quite well. Then we played against Australia in Queensland. 
So it was quite funny. The boys are going. We came down the lift. There was Derek Dooley, God bless his soul. There was Dave Frenchy, Johnny Greaves, um, the coaching staff, obviously, Jeff Taylor. And they're all sitting in a table. And I've came down in a singlet, my shorts. He said, what are you doing, Doug? I said, I'm just getting a hot chocolate and then going back to bed. I said, i got a game tomorrow. Couldn't have timed it any better. All the rest of the boys have gone out. They're all, on the, they're all on the juice before we play Australia. So we've played the game, and I've had as Ocon, a few other, Argent, um, Agostino, a few of the Aussie boys we played. I can't even remember the score, but all I remember was five minutes to go, and he had big Brian Gale. Big Gale and my, we call him, he used to call me Dukes. He said, you're an Aussie on tour, he used to say to me. And when I left the country, oh, I said, I rang him. He was the last person I rang before I left England. I said, Gale, he says, yes, Dukester. I said, the tour has ended as I left, as I left. So, so Gale's yelled out to the boys, and I'm, I'm playing, I'm playing, I'm on trial here to try and get a contract in the UK. And Gale's turned around and says, boys, it's official. Five minutes and we're officially on it. Officially. That was the mid-talk out in the middle of the field. Love it. Five minutes, we're on the juice. So the boys, as much as they they were out there having fun, they they, they put in as well. But the um, you know getting relegated out of the Premier League would have took a lot out of the boys, you know. Absolutely, it took so a lot out of the Then after that, I was out with the lads. I could let my hair down, drank till the cows come in. They they figured out I'd fit in all right, and then um, they grabbed me and they pulled me aside and they said we're going to offer you a contract. Brilliant. And they they spoke to me on the beach in Queensland on the Gold Coast. I grabbed an esky. We had beer everywhere. I saw the boys out of a big foam esky. We had beer. We had all sorts of stuff. And the, I fitted in quite well. And then I had brothers, brothers, Sid, Dane Whitehouse, and Wardy. Right? And they go to me, have you got a police record? I just looked at him funny. I said, uh, why? And he went, I thought that's why Harry bought you. <laughs> well, let's talk about I Harry. Think half the crazy gang had a police. Record. I think half I think the crazy right. gang had a police record, didn't they? I think they did. But Harry is Dave Bassett. Let's talk about so, Dave Bassett. What was he like? Loved him the bits. Um, he, he's been to, he's been to my house. He, lo- he lo- I was honoured. He looked me up in where I live now, um, and he tracked me down. And we had lunch with a friend. And we chatted and chatted and chatted. Um, Harry was a motivator. Mm-hmm. Um, he had what he, his philosophies and what he believes in. Coaching-wise, he knew how to get the best out of players. And that's probably why he was successful in the areas that he was. Yeah. Technical, technical areas, you'd look back. Obviously, the game was different then. I remember a training session. It was Gagey, me, Gailey, and Bees. Paul Beasley, funny man, old Bees. Anyway, ball came in. I took a touch to the right. I put it over to the left, and I've looked at it. Well-weighted pass in front of Gailey. I've got, stop. All right, my son. And I've looked at the gaffer, Harry. Now, if I wanted a kangaroo... I would have got one. Now get that ball and put it in that corner right down there. All right, Gaffer. I'll do that. Got nice. a ball next time. Took a touch and bang. Straight onto the back. With back spin. Adrian Little John brings it down through. Mm-hmm. He goes, that's all right. That's what I want, my son. Put it right in that corner. They're in. It was as funny as I thought I'd done something wrong. But he yeah. was playing the ball out from the back. He didn't want it. He wanted it direct. In behind, mm-hmm. he had some speedsters. He had sit out on the left. He had Adrian Little, John Blake. He was a big lad, and that's and that was the way he played. But he was um, loved in the bits. I got dragged into his office a couple of times. Um, <laughs> in other stories, but he um, he sent me he sent me to Lincoln. He said I've had an offer from Lincoln, my son. I said, "Yeah, all right, H." He said, "I want you to go and have a chat." So I went to Lincoln. I spoke to, um, I think it was Wes. 
Wes was there and he turned around. I said, how long have you been here? He says, four weeks. I said, how long do you think you're going to be here? He said, I don't know. I was sitting bottom of the table in the third division. I said, no worries. Drove back. I said, Harry. I said, yeah. If you're going to, I said, mate, if you're going to sell me, sell me to someone decent. I'm not going. <laughs> he said, all right, my son. Just wanted to make sure. Then he sent me to Plymouth. Yeah. I said, H. Are you trying to tell me something? I said, because if I fall off Plymouth, I'm going to land in Australia. Absolutely. Said, Are you trying to send me back? <laughs> he was a uh, very character. He knew what he wanted. We had a we had a trip in Norway, Switzerland, my first preseason. Ten days, we had eight games. I'll never forget it. The boys had been out the night before. So some of the boys have gone out. I, I never did. I can hand on heart. It was football was football. I was dedicated and I wanted to make a living out of the game. Mm -hmm. So my first pre-season, we're in Norway, Switzerland. Oh, blonde women. Mate, I'm looking, how good's this place? Magnificent sun shining. We went for a pre-match. None of the boys liked it. Anyway, turned around. We've gone to McDonald's. The food was that bad. We yeah. went for the we ended up a pre-match. 22 pounds for Maccas. So it wasn't wow. cheap. I think in that whole trip, I had one beer that was eight pound fifty. This was back in ninety four, ninety five. Eight yeah. pound fifty was about sixteen bucks Australian. So I'm thinking, well, I ain't going to become an alcoholic over here. So we ended up though, or we ended up over. Anyway, we've gone back into a into the um, onto the bus, and he knew that who'd been out the night before. So he's turned around. He said to me, he says, Dukes, he said, I'm not going to leave you out. I played about four games in five days. So I'm going to leave you out today. He said, um, at 10 to 3, he said, Dukester. So why? He said, um, you're starting. Anyway, I put a few good tackles in. And the boys were telling me, Blake, he said, they said, he said, he's here, isn't he? He's here for business, isn't he? And Blake, he said, mate, he was doing that in Australia. He said, he was kicking lumps out of me in Australia. Fairly, of course, Hulk. So he turned around, we hopped on the team bus. And he's turned around, he's gone around to certain people, Charlie Hartfield, mm -hmm. um, question him, Hodge, a few others, and he got the Carl vet. He goes, Carl, you know what you want. He says, You're okay, you do that. And then he got to me. He shook his head. <laughs> he says, You do stuff. He goes, I don't know. He says, You could turn left, you could turn right. You think about what you want to do, how you're going to go. No, I gave you no reason to think of anything. I was a lively, and I still am a lively man, as you know. Mm -hmm. Love life. And anyway, we got back to uh, the, the training back at um, Sheffield United and Paul B. Beasley, funniest man alive. Funniest man alive. Bees. Have you had bees on here? Not yet. You need bees on here. He is a legend. So turn right. around. Harry's walked out of his office. And he's walked past. He said, Duke's out. You've gone down the wrong road. You should have turned left, son, instead of right. Just taking the just taking the pee out of, yeah, out yeah. of Harry and bits and pieces. So but we ended up in um it was Wally Downs ourselves. We ended up in a punch. That wasn't really a punch up, but it was more of a obviously we were chatting we were at the bar. We had a we had a night off, which allowed us to have a drink, you know, mm. during pre-season. It was only one, only one night. It was near the end. Anyway, we all went out together, and obviously there was conflict. There was no punches thrown or anything else, but it was just a wave in the pub, or just one of like that. <laughs> Harry's sitting in the corner watching, and the report came back, and he says, good to see the boys sticking together. Nice. So he knew he had a team, and that's what he was about, team, team bonding, team morale, going in the trenches. Neil Warnock is very similar. My relationship started with Neil, when he sent me to um, Plymouth. Yeah. Neil tried to buy me then and ended up buying me from um, Sheffield United to Oldham. So Harry was funny. He was he was brilliant. He's still um, – I still keep in touch with him. Good. He's on the old blower. Um, Neil Warnock I still keep in touch with as well. Don Hutchinson I do. Um, Jamie Redknapp I do a little. Jamie and Don was at, my, at our wedding. Wow. So for my wife, obviously working at Nike and Mizuno. So – and Hutch I do, Andy Scott I do, Charlie Hartfield. That's where social media all comes into yeah, fantastic yeah. with Facebook and 
Yeah, me and Patty, Mark Patterson. You know, Patterson. Yeah, cool. We've, we have uh, had he's a landscape now. Yeah. Patty. Great guy. Mark Paul Patterson. Whatever, biggies. <laughs> Done, by, hey, Done by the elephant, we should have caught, we called him. <laughs> Lovely so, guy. Doing, doing very well him. now. He's a legend. You know what? And you look back at the – it's at their Howard Kendall days – but um, go back to Dave's days. He, he knew what he wanted out of a player. I've seen teapots fly across dressing rooms and stop myself from laughing. He threw the teapot. It's fell. It's gone all over him. <laughs> it's everywhere. So wow. Harry had a bit of a feisty in him as well. But you know what? Harry just wanted to win. Yeah, yeah. Absolutely. Like us all, you know, we wanted to be successful. We wanted to be successful for Sheffield United. He, he loved the club, as you know. One of the guys. Um, and the club loved him. Yeah. So for me, he was, you know, he's he's a big part of my career. Mm-hmm. Um, people say to me, you know, why Sheffield United? And I say, well, father fans are fantastic. The club's fantastic. It's where I start and that's where I ended. So as you know, you've seen the pictures of my bar. I love um, the bar. The We've got to talk about the bar. United. It's about, Did you design that? It's It's incredible. Yeah, totally did. I, I'll be honest with you, mate, before you I, – I've obviously leaving Sheffield United. Um, Dad wasn't well. I had to spend probably another six years with Dad before he passed away. Um, but I think deep down, and I'll say this openly, I struggled mentally uh, with losing my career. Football in England, as you know, is, it's in your face. Mm. You know, every time you turn a page on – Obviously, Bar Sport, I bought a sport magazine thinking it was a sport magazine. I opened up and there was boobs on the second page. And I thought, this ain't sport. (laughs) I thought it was a newspaper, sport newspaper. I went, I'm reading about sport and there's boobies. I think I didn't buy that that paper anymore. That was when I was in Hull. (laughs) So I struggled. I struggled all with with the game. Mm -hmm. And I'll be honest with you, mate, I still do. I still do. Even to this day, I wake up every day in pain. Um, my body's a mess. I take painkillers to get through the day. Um, that's another story. But the um, that's that was part of the reason why I left Sheffield United as reserve team manager. Neil Warnock said to me, he said, you will be the next manager of Sheffield United. He was grooming wow. to be. So I came home. And as you know, that bar was built three years ago. I've been back 23 years. If you walked into my house, you would not know I was a professional footballer. Really? So stuff hasn't come out. Obviously, I've been involved in the game coaching with my kids and senior football, and I've continued coaching all the way through the journey. Mm. But um, I did build it. We did. It's a one-off. It's, it's a good. I'll send you some pics so you can – I'll send you some pictures. So it will end up in the star, didn't it? Yeah, yeah. We got the we've... keg on tap. We've shared some of the pictures on our social media. It always goes down an absolute storm on Twitter. When it's your birthday every year, we put that bar on. Well, that's me. Um, it's a shame, mate, because I tell you now, if I'd been in Australia, um, would have been sitting at the bar. Ah, yeah, because you're in Tassie at the moment, so we can't see it. But do do have a look online. You can you can Google it, but also we'll reshare it again so people can see it. But um, we'll Doug, I do. It all. I'm get, I get. I leave. I leave tomorrow back to Australia, so ah, I might be able yes, to send you some clicks through um, Messenger. Right, Doug, I'm going to run through some names. You tell me what you think of and maybe a story, an anecdote around just these names. So first up, Simon Tracy. Do you want the good or the bad? The bad. <laughs> Worst trainer ever. Wow. Sat, ne- sat next to him in the dressing room. Loved him the bits. In fact, I could honestly say there wasn't a player I didn't like, and that's the truth. Yes. We had a run-in at a Christmas do, mm-hmm. which was a punch-up. I was I was lobbing knives. He's a goalkeeper. Should have been catching him. He'd been drinking all day. Anyway, um, one thing led to another, and, yeah, one o'clock the club doctor was out to stitch him up. But... The story of it is we're still mates. We drink. It took two days to get over. I think I had, not proud of it, but one, two, 
three altercations in my career with different players at a club. Clubs. Clubs. So it's not only to be named Mark, Mark Forum. Obviously, mm-hmm. I root Mark live with me. He had a run in with Wally Downs. Um, it happens at clubs. You know, you've got 50-odd pros all fighting for the position. There's yeah. going to be people misgrunted. But as you do, like after a game, you shake your hand and you get on with it. Yeah, absolutely, um, as it should be. Trace, Trace had, I think he had a fight the year before at the Christmas do and a fight the year before that at the Christmas do. <laughs> but that's a good, he's a good bloke. Yeah, we've he's heard a good that. Man. All right, another one. Yeah. Carl Viet. Very quiet man. Very surprised when he, he's left his wife. He's, he's split up and he's got a new wife. Apparently he walked out the house with his golf clubs on his bag, on his shoulders, and just walked out the house. So to hear that was quite funny because Carl is he's now um, managing um, Adelaide United in the A-League. Um, him and Damien Murray's there with him. He's one who's his best man at his wedding. Um, Carl's a very uh, lovely bloke. Listen, he ain't got a bad bone in him. Yeah. The best story ever, we had um, Dean Riddle. Yeah, he's a physio. sports trainer. Yeah. We're up at um, Norton Lee Park. Anyway, Gaffer wasn't there. Dean Riddle's took and he said to Blakey. And Blakey's, he had a bit of a chip on his shoulder at times, but that, that man could have been anything. He was, he was strong, speed. He was he, he was a weapon. He could have been a weapon, and I'll I'll probably honestly say it. You know, he, he'll probably tell you. I think Forrest looked at him back then, five million, and they said he was a bit lazy. If he had the attitude of some other people, he could have been anything. He he was that training unbelievable. Anyway, Dean Riddles have said something and said, "Give us twenty, <laughs> Blake. He's gone. You give us 20. So. He, uh, he turned around and didn't do his 20 push-ups. <laughs> so he's going to Carl Veer, and you know, five or a couple of minutes later, something else happened. Carl, give us 20. <laughs> Carl's gone, no. <laughs> like he didn't do them. I'm not doing them. You give me 20. So for Carl to say that, it was quite yeah. being there, mate. It was quite funny. So nice. they're humorous around the paddock. But um, <laughs> you know, Carl's a g- gentleman. Great lad, and I wish him everything. I texted him actually um, about a month ago. Great. Sean Murphy's over in um, Western Australia. We had a fishing trip. Um, he nearly fell asleep at the wheel. I grabbed it just before we smashed, what? which was pretty good. Wow. So, I'm glad. Just in case. All right, next one. We've Don been on the road. We've been on Hutchison. the road. Um, Hutch. I didn't say about Hutch. That he had he had talent with his feet. You know, played for Liverpool, played um, West Ham. Anyway, he uh, Hutch, he was a character. Mm. I caught up with him a couple of times when I'd been back to the UK with work. Anyway, went out to this nice restaurant. And you never ask players how much they get. It's mm. a rule in football. If you and I are all, I wouldn't say, how much you're on a week. You would never ask me. I'd never ask. Bonuses are structured by the captain. That would have been um, Ned, Alan Kelly, mm-hmm. Freddie Flintstone, I called him, because he looked like Freddie Flintstone. So they all had nicknames. <laughs> so anyway, turned around and um, oh, Freddie Flintstone, he was a great keeper. And Trace had the wiggle. He'd be trying and he'd be, he had the little wiggle going. But he, uh, so Hutch turned around and basically, um, I think he got, uh, what would you say, to, he turned around I said, mate, by the way, out of curiosity, what sort of money? What was the most you got? And, he, and to be fair to Don, he told me. I said, ah, well played, mate. I said, well done. You know, he's been successful in what he's doing and all the rest of it. So as we come out to pay, there was a Scotland shirt up and he'd obviously signed a Scotland shirt and gave it to the, the owner. It was his local down down south. Anyway, he turned around. He <laughs> go to pay. He was in shout. He picked him up. He picked me up in his continent Continental. Or his Bentley, or Bentley Continental, or whatever it was. Anyway, he's gone cash only. <laughs> he's turned around and looked at me. He went, "You got any money?" Oh, <laughs> went, yeah. He had his card to tap and go. Yeah. Well, I ended up paying. He just told me he was earning thousands and whatever. <laughs> he's me paying for it. I ended up paying for the dinner. But um, 
Don and I, he's, he's, we speak, we speak a fair bit. And um, funny man, the story you would have heard the story of me getting on the roof. We'll tell it on the bus. We have. So we came out. We we're, were going to. Where were we going? We we're playing against. We're away. So Martin, Martin, the bus driver, brilliant. I drive trucks and bits and pieces. I got my big semi license and that here. Never bought, never drove a bus till I pinched the one out front of um, Sheffield United. So Martin had gone inside, I've left it running while they're all bringing the gear on. So I've put it in first, and I'm away. So I'm driving around the car park at the Blades at, at, at United, driving around. I was enjoying it. Just yeah. driving around. <laughs> it's just gone. Come on, take it. Let's go out the street. So we brought it in and away we went. So Hutch and I's in there. Howard Kendall's at the front, I'm at the back. And we look up, there's a sunroof. Yeah. And Hutch, I'm going to call Hutch misleading. And Dukes to being Dukes to Howard Kendall, the gaffer then. I had a look up. I reckon I could get up there. We're coming out of North, we're coming out of Wood Seats. You know the Wood Seats you go up the hill? Yep. We're doing about, we're doing about two mile an hour. So I've looked at it. I've climbed up the sunroof, out of the bus. I've walked along the top of the bus. There's another sunroof down the bottom. I put my head down. He said, hey, Gaffer, <laughs> how Kendall? He's gone. I said, is there any chance of a game today? <laughs> he says, you stupid Australian. Get out of here. Get in here now. So I got in there and – uh, it was safe, you know what I mean? We're only yeah, doing yeah. two. I think Hutch tells the story. We're doing 120 k's down the motorway, which would have made me like Tommy Cruz. Yeah. The, what's it called? Impossible. Well, Mission Impossible, Impossible, yeah. That's fantastic. That's fantastic. Do you have someone that up. was a, a best friend for you during your whole time? I'll, tell, I'll give you this story tonight. It'll make you laugh. Peter Kachura. Wow. Comes to us. We're playing. We're playing Birmingham. Walks in, Viv Busby goes, Dukester, look after Pete. Yeah, okay, no worries. We had Gary Ablett on loan from Everton, myself. Him and I played at the back. Uh, Pete's in my room. Pete can't talk English at all. No English at all. He says, you'll be right, Dukester, look after him. He's got a wedding ring on this finger which I believe, which I, I learned, Russia, they wear it on here, opposite uh-huh. hand than we do on this one. So we're in the room. We're in the room before tea. Anyway, I'm, I'm giving him lessons in English. And as you can tell, my English ain't the best anyway, on top of that. So anyway, sorted it out. We're in there for about three hours trying to learn a little bit about Pete. Lovely kid, lovely bloke. We played against, um, they scored a cracker against Wolves when we had 10 yeah. men. We had Rocky Balboa go and hutched head to um, tails. He said, uh, mate, you couldn't handle Rocky. Oh, the tiger. He got sent off. He said, um, and then Pete's turned around. He smashed one in five minutes to go against Wolves to win 2-1. Spackman was there then. There's some good names. Um, anyway, Pete's came for We came out for dinner. Viv Busby walks up to him all and goes, all right, Pete. There he goes. G'day, mate. <laughs> First letter, first words he ever learned in England was "g'day, mate." I love it. Just the so importance. We stuff. had some laughs, just laughs and giggles and all the rest of it. But he was good. That's Probably great. Andy Scott. Andy Scott, Don Hutchinson would probably be the two that I keep in touch the most. Um, Friendship-wise. Um, when I come back to Sheffield, which I haven't done in a few years, it's like I've never been away. Um, I jump on my Facebook, if you've seen, you jump on my Facebook, you can see the United boys, Charlie Hartfield. As we know, Charlie done some time. You know, he hasn't been well. So, you know, you reach out to people. Um, Frenchie, they were the jolly ups. Him and Johnny Greaves, funniest men alive. I'd go, Frenchie, if I do this, it's hurting. You'd go, well, don't do it. <laughs> <laughs> then you, you turn around and go, you know, to get a rub in soccer these days, everyone's on the massage table to get rubbed and everything else. Mate, we couldn't get a rub. I'd go, you have to rub yourself. And you get the, you go, 
he's got the oil. He's got the oil. So you get the oil on your legs and rub yourself. I used to put Vaseline <laughs> across my eyebrows and across my knees. So if there was any collision, I'd just slip away. Yeah. So anyway, um, you'd yell out to Frenchy, Frenchy, where's the oil? Who's got the oil? You'd turn around and go, the Arabs. <laughs> Arabs have the oil. Mate, Derek funniest French. man alive. He'd be, he'd, Great he'd, guy. He's, um, he, he's a beautiful man. I, I caught up with him, taken for a few pints. And like I said, Gailey, every time I've come back, Brian Gale, I know he has nothing to do with football and that much at the moment. His son's in Melbourne. He's been to my house. I've had Neil Warnock's daughter living at my place and his other other. So I've had, I get phone calls. Glenn Hodges' daughter at my place, I gave her a job. So Hodgie, I keep in touch with as well, Glenn. I room with Glenn, the first one in Norway. That was an experience on its own. <laughs> I'll leave it at that. Okay. And we just, <laughs> just characters in the game. It's just characters, yeah. just funny, just funny characters, big gaily. Yeah. Um, you know, but. They all, Mitch Ward, Wardy and Brads and Dane, the three slaps they called them. Mm -hmm. They're just, honestly, to Sheffield United supporters, they're legends. To me, they're beautiful blokes. Top lads. That's really Top good lads. to hear. Yeah, you were um, lucky. You had some really good characters during your time. That's uh, Actually, we need to talk about that Bruce we, Dyer story because uh, you, you mentioned it before. Bruce Dyer also eventually went on to play for Sheffield United. But what was the story in the tunnel with Bruce Dyer? I'd moved to um, Oldham. And Bruce and um, Harry was commentating the game, and Harry turned around and goes, um, "Bruce Dyer." So Harry turns around and says, "Hey, don't get too close to him." You know, Harry's giving me some tips. Obviously, he was at Crystal Palace, and I never forget. I don't like cheats. I don't like cheats, and there's only one occasion I never shook a bloke's hand after the game because I wanted to rip his throat out, which was uh, the boy from Millwall. That was his. Um, it'll come to me, but Bruce Dyer. So anyway. I've got in front of him and I actually won the ball to play. Anyway, he's pushed me. He's cheated. He's got the up hand. He's shoved me. I've gone forward. Ref's gone play on. Ball's gone down the road. Ball's been whipped in. Bang, goal. Was it my fault? Yeah, you take it to heart. And today, your man. Was it fair? No, I've had a chat with the referee. So for the next, let's just say for the next 20 minutes, I wanted revenge. So as you do, you run like this down, don't you? I just had my arm on his shoulder running, going, ah. trying to kill him. I wasn't happy. I wasn't a happy chappy at all. So we've gone up the tunnel, and I put me two my studs straight down the back of his Achilles as we've gone up the steps. He's turned around and gone, whack. I went, right. He got a, he got a slap, and I gave him. He got one. Ray Houghton got one, and there was about a six-foot-six physio. I wanted him too. I'm in their dressing room, wanting a piece of them. So it was me in their dressing room going, well, bring it on, boys. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to rip you. I didn't care. Mm. That's when the red mist comes down. And um, how would you say? The no when the vocab comes in, bring it on. Anyway, you got in. Coppers all broke it all up and all the rest of it. Anyway, it was live on Sky. I didn't, didn't hurt anyone. There's no, okay. it was handbag, and it was handbagging for it. was probably more pushing and shoving than anger, you know what I mean? Yeah. Anyway, the um, why not, why not drag me? So, what do you mean? He said, mate, he's worried I'll get a red card. And I said, mate, I'm in control. This is when I am in control. <laughs> it was, um, <laughs> so Brucey died, and I, Brucey died, but he, we, um, we took me off at half time, and as we did, Neil and I had a, um, we had a great relationship. Obviously, he took me back at, um, first signing at Oldham. Yeah. Um, Andy Ritchie, Richard Graham. We had some good stitch from Manchester United. He was there. We had some some good and big Sean Garner. He's at Tramia. Yeah. So I think I've been fortunate all in some really good characters along the way. You know, you've, football's a life of. Um, I'm thinking about doing a book. You should. A lot of people have said to me it probably helped me in um, mentally way as well as uh, expressing myself and. With some stories, because as as you can tell, there's many. Oh, there's yes. many. Um, and it needs to be, and I know what I'm going to call it if I do the ups and downs and the ins and outs of a professional footballer. Because football's a roller coaster. One week you've had a great game, next week's the crowd's booing you, <laughs> next thing you're a legend. 
you know, I'm on social media and I see what sort of, you know, you can see everyone has an opinion of football, as you know. You know, so it's an interesting one. But um, Neil, Neil and I had a love-hate, great relationship, and I still keep in touch with him now. We had COVID. I rang him. And I said, you're right. I sent him a text. You're right, Gaffer? And he turned around and he said, um, no, I'm all right, son. He said, I've got COVID, bit of sniffles. He said, I just wanted a couple of days off. He said, the uh, Masters, the golf starting in um, two days, so I might as well have a couple of bit of time off. Perfect. Time. So that's his sort of humour. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, you were lucky. You're right. You, know, you should write a book. If you do uh, write a book, you know we'll we'll promote it. Uh, and also, Doug, we need to ask what you're up to these days, mate. What are you doing? I have um, four businesses. Wow. Tiny staff. Boost Juice, Meadow Hall. Do you know Boost Juice at Meadow Hall? Yeah, absolutely. The Juice Bar. Well, I have two franchises. I have two of them. I've had them for 16 years. Wow. And then I have a chemi- and then I have a chemical business, which is recycling plastic, um, such as uh, 20, 30 tonne, which nothing goes to landfill, that will clean, will clean IBCs, which is a 1,000 litre, 200s, you know, like a big shredder. Um, five trucks, EPA, 30 staff. Um, and then the other big business is my health. So between them and my health and coaching soccer, that sums up my week. Pretty busy. On a day-to-day. Boost juice is seven days a week. Um, the other one's five days, sometimes six. So life's, life is busy. Life's hectic. It's... I suppose keeps you from going um, insane. I suppose. Uh, well, with you, with you being so busy. Sixteen we, years, boost juice. We we really appreciate you uh, giving up the time to speak to Chef United Way when when you are working, you know, literally every day, um, because it's been a lot of fun. And I know that you've got stories, like you say, that could go in a book, and you could tell for days, and and we'd listen to them. Um, but Doug, uh, we we should probably leave it there purely because we've taken up an hour of your time, and say. Thank you for joining us, Doug Hodgson. Good luck in the future. And, of course, up the blades. Thanks for having me. Sheffield United, what a club, what a supporters. Love the club, love the supporters, love everything about Sheffield United. Respect. <laughs>